Okay, we're going to go ahead and uh, get started here. Um, just wanted to welcome everyone and thank everyone for coming to uh, the next of our Distinguished Speaker Series. My name is Mike Dam, the treasurer of Paradise Valley Community College's HOSA chapter. Uh, tonight we're, wel we're welcoming Representative Heather Carter. Uh, she's a representative of Arizona State District 15. Uh, Representative Carter moved to Arizona f 25 years ago. She's worked for 15 years in education, including as a seventh grade teacher of English and Social Studies at the Paradise Valley Unified School District. She was first elected to office in 2010 and is the chairperson of the Health Committee and also served on the Education and Environment Committees. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Representative Heather Carter. Uh, right now, I'm still working full-time. Uh, I teach at Arizona State University in the Mary Lou Fulton Teachers College. I'm a clinical associate professor, and I prepare teachers and principals to work on our K-12 schools. Prior to that, though, I, was, um, I, I worked in real estate, and I was a pharmaceutical rep. So here's my joke, because I serve as the house health chair. I am technically a doctor, right, Dr. Carter? It's Ed Leadership, shh, not an MD. And I was a pharmaceutical rep, so I'm infinitely qualified to be the house health chair. <laughs> but I, it's kind of, it's, it's partially true, because I have an idea of, what's, of, of how the industry works from that one narrow niche. But in, in terms of our legislature, we're a citizen legislature, which means each person, when they decide to run for office and hopefully win, they bring their unique skills and talents to the Capitol and add to the body of work we do down at the Capitol. So we'll have, we have lawyers down there, we have people who run their own business, we have a few teachers, uh, we do have a, a medical doctor on the health commi committee, Dr. Eric Meyer. But the, but the citizen legislature is just as diverse as the state of Arizona. And so I focus my, my policy work for, because uh, you've got to really focus the work that you do down at the Capitol in two particular areas, and that's education and health care. And in those two areas, I like to say I, my policy work influences two-thirds of the budget, so that's a, good, that's a good place to be. And that doesn't mean I don't have to still vote on water policy, ag, ag policy, tax policy, but in terms of my focus in my area that I work down there, I spend most of my time working on education and healthcare legislation. So as you can see, I've chaired uh, a number of working committees, some of them pretty diverse. We've tried to tackle some of the most important, complicated issues during the off season. And during that work, I've worked on things like health care, health care reform, and education reforms. The legislature is comprised of 30 legislative districts. And I want to give you a little Civics 101 to put everything we're going to talk about tonight in context. I represent District 15. There are two representatives and one senator from every district. So there's 30 legislative districts. My district is all of North Phoenix, and you can kind of see it up here. It goes from the Scottsdale City boundary, and my laser pointer's in the car. Darn, I, I even brought a brand new one, but that's okay. Just pretend I'm pointing to the, the Scottsdale city boundary over on the east, and that's the Glendale Peoria city boundary on the west. Um, it's everything north of the 101, up to about Dixaletta, and over on the west side, Carefree Highway. It jogs down on the east, Kierlin Commons and PV Mall area, and over on the west, just north of uh, ASU West. So just a quick show of hands. Any constituents in the room? Yay, they all get A's for the night. If there's a grade, they get the A. Um, the district just south of me is District 28, and the district just north of me is District 1. To the east is 23, and to the west is District, uh, I think it's 22. So <coughs> the entire um, state has 30 legislative districts. There's 60 people serving in the House, 30 in the Senate, and the magic numbers are 31, 16, and 1. So for any piece of legislation to pass, you need 31 people in the House, you need 16 people in the Senate, but probably the most challenging piece to any policy work that we do is making sure that the governor signs it, because if she vetoes it, we either have to go back to the drawing board or it's just pretty much dead for that legislative session. Another piece I want to point out to you just about my district, just to kind of let you know the, the constituency base that I represent, there are 215,000 total people in my district, and all of the districts are about that same size. So they're anywhere between 211 and 215,000 people. But they all are made up of a different voter registration makeup. So in my district, there are 55,000 Republicans, 41,000 independents, and 23,000 or 28,000 Democrats. 
The district just south of me is what's called a competitive district. So my district's what's called a Republican-dominated district. The district just south of me is a competitive district. It's almost a third and a third and a third. The district just south of that is a Democrat-dominated district, and its voter registrations are exactly flipped from what mine is. But the reason why this is important is just to kind of put it all in political context. We, are, we do have a Republican majority in both the House and the Senate, and the governor is Republican, and so that's what's called, when you hear me say majority, that's what, I, that's what I'm talking about, just in terms of voter registration and who is elected. The rest of the information about my district, three fantastic, high-performing, wonderful school districts, Cave Creek Unified, Paradise Valley, and Deer Valley Unified. The airport that's just over to the west of us here is actually one of the busiest airports in the country. Um, and you don't even necessarily know it until you really spend some time in that area. And a lot of people understand the Scottsdale Airport, but that airport, they have really robust pilot training programs and an entire commerce uh, center around there where there's lots of business and development. So that's in the center of my district. And the largest employers in my district are Cox Communication, USAA, Honeywell, American Express, John C. Lincoln, Mayo Clinic, and the list goes on and on and on. So that just gives you a little bit of a, of a landscape of who I represent and what is the makeup of our district. The reason why I want to make sure that I, I bring that to your attention is because anytime we talk about policy, so tonight we're going to really dive into health care policy, but I want you to remember this. When we go down to the Capitol and you come down to the Capitol or constituents come down to the Capitol, they're always talking to me about, you know, vote. We, we support this bill. We don't support this bill. We think we should be spending money here. We think we should be working on this. It's really focused around policy. But policy is only one side of the coin. The other side of that coin is politics. And so there's always this yin and yang relationship between policy and politics. And no more is that present than in the healthcare industry today, if you think about what's happening related to the Affordable Care Act, which we're gonna dive into later. So I just want you to keep that lens on as we dive into some of the policy issues, because you can't isolate the policy work from the politics. And so if you look at it with just one side of the equation, the skills and the talents and the abilities that make you a good policymaker, if you think about it, the bill we voted on yesterday was what, 420 some pages long? And basically that bill simply changed all of the words in statute that were um, listed as handicapped to persons with disability, and it was a 420 some page bill. So I mean, you have to be really tenacious and, and it's tedious work diving into policy, but that's not the same skills that make you successful over in the political world. You know, we talk in eight second sound bites, um, it's all about the campaign trail, and so they're really unique and different. And I try to work right in the middle of that Venn diagram where the two overlap because you have to do good enough, you have to do great policy work so that you can get reelected, and if you don't get reelected, you can't do the policy work. So they really do go together, and that's going to come into play when I talk to you about some of the work we've done. So this is the scope of my work at the Capitol. <coughs> We're at the Capitol 100 days, technically. That's by our Constitution. Now, if we don't get our work done, we can actually extend the length of session. And last year we did. We went 152 days. But usually we have between 1,200 and 1,500 bills. So last year there was about 1,200 bills. 280 of them make it through the committee process. About half of the bills are at least heard in committee. And you guys have seen Schoolhouse Rock, right? I'm just a bill. I'm not going to sing because my voice is off. Um, well, and that we can hear a bill in committee, and it might die in committee. We had a bill yesterday die in committee uh, related to vapor products. Um, so bills die in committee all the time. So out of the bills that make it out of both the House and both the Senate, it's about last year was 280, and the governor signs the majority of them, so about 250, but she does veto, usually on average, the last three years that I've served, 25 to 30 bills a year. She can veto them for a number of reasons. A, she just doesn't like the policy, or B, maybe she thinks it needs to go back to the legislature for, for some work. We've never overturned a veto since I've been there, but we have brought bills that have been vetoed once back and amended other bills to try and get the policy through and fix the problems that were identified by the executive. So it's a real fluid process and it is ongoing. And so for 100 days, literally, and this is what I was, I was calling everybody tonight, I just got off the floor and raced up here in the traffic. And so we can be there sometimes 24 hours a day. I've served now three years and I've done, I think, four all-nighters. And it's not easy, but uh, that's, that's what you do. 
So this legislative session, we're not allowed to introduce any more bills. There's a time frame where you can introduce bills. We've got about uh, 1,100, 1,200 bills introduced. And I don't know how many will make it this year. Uh, we've failed a couple bills in committee. We're, on, we're actually not passing as many bills as I, I thought, but we are definitely still working through the process. So obviously everybody knows at the Capitol we pass bills, and that's what all the news always talks about. But our one and only constitutionally required job is to pass a balanced budget. And we cannot sine die, which means end session, until we have a balanced budget. And we're not like the federal government that can roll over, roll over, roll over, and just go years without passing a budget. At the end of each fiscal year, which is the end of June, our expenses have to match our appropriations, or excuse me, our revenue. And so we have to dive into the budget each year. We budget on three-year cycles, but that is the one constitutional job that we have. Now, I've heard many stories of them literally, because we have to do it by June 30th, putting a, a towel over the clock so we don't see that it rolls to midnight, just so that it's still the previous fiscal year legislatively wise. But, but so far, my time down there, we've been able to pass everything by the end of June. Last year, we passed it like June 15th or something. So we kind of got pretty close to the end, but we were still able to do it. And why is this important? Because all of our health care decisions, one thing I learned as being a teacher, you know, I wanted to go down there and dive into education policy. Nine times out of ten, the conversation went right to the money. How much is it going to cost? Do we have the money to do this? Because we've got great ideas for health policy. I've got fantastic ideas for health policy, but can we afford them? And what's the cost-benefit analysis on that? So you've got to understand the state budget. So the state of Arizona, if it was a business, is just over about a 30, almost 30, $35 billion enterprise. So that's a pretty expensive business. But if you drill down to just the bank account that I control, which is called the general fund, as a legislator, that general fund is only about $8.5 billion. Now we're on track, though. We think we're going to be pushing up about $9 billion this legislative session. But out of that money, the majority of it, 75% of it is out of my control. I don't get to decide how we spend the money. It is either dictated to me by statute, or it's dictated to me by the voters, or some sort of either population and inflation funding, which is also in statute. So the three areas that we fund, I mean, if you combine all the different areas we fund, they really sur surround three areas, which are listed up there. But the funny way to remember it is we do three things in Arizona. We educate we medicate, and we incarcerate. And those are the three, almost a third, a third, and a third. I mean, I'm oversimplifying, but it just gives you an idea of, of where we spend our money. So today's budget is, is, is extremely complex, and K-12 education, higher education, health care, and our Department of Corrections drives a lot of our budget. But right now, what the governor is putting forth in terms of the budget this year <laughs> is that for the first time in 2015, we're going to be free from temporary measures, bridges, and things like that. So we've already sold the capital, which you guys have already know. We've already sold a lot of the state buildings. And so we're financing that debt, and we're paying that debt back, but we received the revenue from it when we hit the fiscal crisis. Uh, we've done things like delay payments to schools, which we're still rolling over. But for this year, we're actually finally uh, balanced in terms of, of not having to do additional um, fiscal gymnastics, let's just call them. And so what we're trying to do is by 2016 to be structurally balanced. So when I took office back in 2011, I was elected in 10, started my term in 11, I had to cut $1.7 billion out of the state budget. Our revenues were over $10 billion and our ongoing expenses, or excuse me, our expenses was over $10 billion, like $10.6 billion, but our revenue was 6.9. And so we had to make some really, really deep cuts and move some things around and juggle things on paper. But then we started to see the economy turn around. And I think everybody's feeling a little bit better than they were probably in 2007, 2008. We're on the right track. Revenues are increasing, but we're not fully recovered yet. And so we still need to be really careful because what we don't want to do is create ongoing spending that we can't sustain with revenue. And part of the budget process is literally with a crystal ball and a lot of really smart economists try to determine how much money are we going to make next year, just like a business does, because that determines how much money we're going to spend. And through the legislative process, that's what we negotiate. So 
some of the things that we've done is we've modernized state government in terms of hiring and firing practices, uh, consolidating agencies, and it, we've used technology to create efficiencies. We've done a lot of really good things, but we're still on that road to recovery to make sure that we're not spending more money that we think might come in in the future. The big budget drivers this year are going to be obviously CPS. I mean, everybody's heard the crisis we're in right now. I mean, it is an immediate, real crisis. And so we are going to have to spend some hefty dollars to not only just bring the system back up to status quo, because it is, it is in dire situation, but then also to reform CPS. So that's going to take a lot of money. Education funding is always top of the mind when we, when we talk about the budget, but I'm happy to report last year uh, with the health care decisions we made, we are able to do some of the things this year that we probably wouldn't have been able to do if we didn't make the health care decisions we made last year. We had to address the Affordable Care Act in the state of Arizona. So I'm not going to dive into each one of these pieces of the Affordable Care Act. I mean, I can try to answer questions later if there are any, but I want to show you how what we did in Arizona is one small piece of a larger federal puzzle called the Affordable Care Act, a.k.a. Obamacare. So in, Ari or in, in, in the Affordable Care Act, we have things like uh, state health insurance exchange, except we don't have a state-run exchange. We have a federal exchange. Arizona decided not to run, or the governor decided not to run an exchange using state dollars. We have Medicaid expansion. So in Arizona, we restored our Medicaid population and slightly expanded it, and that's what I'm going to spend the rest of my evening talking to you about. We in Arizona have nothing to do with the employer mandate that is administered at the federal level. Of course, Arizona businesses have to follow that federal mandate, which of course has been now sort of moved on down the calendar a, a little bit. Um, the individual mandate in terms of who must purchase insurance or pay a fine, uh, no pre-existing, ex excuse me, no exclusions for pre-existing conditions, that's all part of the Federal Affordable Care Act, and then finally extending the dependent age to, to, to 26. Now, the bill was what, 1,200 pages? I don't even know how many pages. It was something like 1,200 pages, and I've reduced it to six puzzle pieces. So that is extremely oversimplified, and there are a lot of, of very tenacious details in each one of those puzzle pieces. But tonight we're just going to talk about Medicaid restoration and expansion, because as House Health Chair, that's what we did in Arizona. And I want to make sure that you understand what our work was that we did in Arizona. So <coughs> I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the history of Medicaid. And then what the a slight expansion and um, the expansion and the restoration population is. In Arizona, we have probably the youngest, for lack of a better term, Medicaid system in the country. We did not become part of the, the federal Medicaid program until 82. I always say 86. I get that one wrong. Okay, so it's, um, not until 1982. We were the last ones to sort of embark upon the Medicaid program that was administered at the, with the, in partnership with the federal government. So we looked at what people did across the country, took the best and the brightest ideas, put an Arizona spin on it, and rolled it out here in Arizona. And Arizona's Medicaid program is considered the gold standard across the country. It is so well renowned that even Governor Romney in his third presidential debate said, let me give the money to states like Arizona and Rhode Island because they've shown they can do more and do better with the money than other states and the federal government has done. It is cost effective. It is efficient. We have some of the best health outcomes, and it is truly a public-private partnership. So a lot of people don't understand this about Medicaid, and I have to be honest with you. I give this speech, I mean, it's like I do this two, three, four times a week during the interim, not so much during session, um, but, but during the interim two and three and four times, you would be surprised at how many health care professionals do not understand the difference between Medicaid and Medicare, and they don't understand what the Medicaid system is specifically. So in, Med in Arizona and Medicaid, if you're eligible and you make five, or excuse me, 100% of the federal poverty level or lower, you are eligible to be um, on Medicaid. I'm going to show you the eligibility populations. And once you're eligible, you get to pick from a number of different plans. So in Maricopa County, because the bid just went out, it's five plans, right? 
I think it's five plans in Maricopa County. And those plans are based upon whatever you as a consumer wish to, to, to enroll in. And you choose your enrollment based upon the same thing you and I may choose our enrollment at our employer if we got to pick from three plans. You look at the network, you look at the doctors that are there, you look at what hospitals you go to. And so maybe one plan works for you, but one plan doesn't. Now in our rural areas, we have a little bit less choice, but definitely in our urban areas, we have great choice. And so it's a public-private partnership. And what people don't understand is that Medicaid plan is partnered with a private insurance plan. So for example, Aetna has a Medicaid plan. Blue Cross Blue Shield has a Medicaid plan. And so the, the, the payer is actually spread out in Arizona across a public-private partnership. So in a hospital, they may take, in terms of from their patients, a payment for their patients, there are some private pay, there are some that can't pay, there are some that are privately insured, some that are employed by their, by their employers, some may be on Medicare, some may be on Medicaid. But those are the big sort of payers in terms of, your, of patients that you would see in the healthcare market. So in Arizona, when we hit the economic crisis, we had to freeze part of our population. And I'm gonna show you what those populations are in the next slide, but just to kind of look at this graph, when we froze that population, the number of people who were insured actually declined. They fell off the Medicaid rolls. And they fell off because they became ineligible for whatever reason. Maybe they forgot to fill out their paperwork, which is what everybody always says. And as a teacher, I'm like, oh, they forgot to do their homework. It's actually not one of the most common reasons, but yes, that is one of the reasons. A lot of times, they become financially ineligible. So if they get a Christmas job, for example, and they make $50 more than the eligibility level, they are no longer eligible for Medicaid. Then when they are not working, when the holiday is over, and they are now re-eligible, they couldn't get back on the plan because we froze the population. Or uh, persons with uh, severe mental illness, if they became incarcerated, which unfortunately that happens, and they transition from Medicaid into the Department of Corrections Health System, and once they were released, they were no longer eligible for Medicaid. And if you think about their medical needs, and sometimes it's, they require um, pharmaceuticals to even just maintain their daily lives, they were no longer eligible for any insurance because they, quote, fell off the rolls. So our numbers were declining. And at the high watermark, our, our entire population is just wavering around 1 million, 1.2 million. But just in this childless adult population, which I'm going to talk to you about in a minute, the, the enrollment went from 240 down to 66,000 in December. That's how many people, quote, fell off of Medicaid. So when we went to restore it using the Affordable Care Act, we actually restored coverage for that population and slightly expanded. So the Affordable Care Act provision said, states, whoever you may be, so Arizona, if you take your current eligibility, which in Arizona was 100%, and increase it to 133%, we'll pay for the difference 100% for three years. So that expansion population in Arizona is 57,000 people. And that's why that, you see where it says Prop 204 population versus the expansion. I forgot to put that slide on there. I'm used to, or it's not on there, is it? It is? With the Prop 204 population? The chart, okay. Well, prop, did it, the explanation of Prop 204 is not on there, is it? Okay, so let me explain Prop 204. Do you guys know what Prop 204 is? Okay, back in 1996, Arizona voters said, we in Arizona believe that childless adults who make less than 100% of the federal poverty level should be eligible for Medicaid. There were some challenges with the language. We had to go back to the ballot. It passed, but we had to go back to the ballot in 2000 and say, we got the language right. Now, do you really want people who make less than 100% of the federal poverty level and they're childless do you want them to be eligible for Medicaid? And the voters twice resoundingly said yes. Remember back to that slide on the budget where I said the voters dictate to me how I spend the money? That's what the voters dictated that I spend my money on in health care. And it was a major budget driver in negotiations when we we're trying to balance the budget. Because if the voters have mandated it, I can't change it. That's Prop 105. So anything we do at the ballot box, if the voters pass it, it becomes, quote, voter protected. At the legislature, the only thing I can do is further the mission. I can't reduce, change, modify it. I can only do more. 
And so the voters said, we want that population covered. And at the time, all the way up until the Affordable Care Act, we were only one of six states in the country that covered their childless adult population. So Arizona, with the Affordable Care Act passage, was very unique and different than, say, Texas or California or any other state that didn't cover their childless adult population. Because the Affordable Care Act would pay for 100% of it. But Arizona was, I guess you can call it, ahead of its time and said, we want that population covered long before President Obama was ever president, long before the Affordable Care Act. Arizona voters said, we want to cover that population. And so because that's where our Arizona voters set the eligibility, the Affordable Care Act on the expansion would only pay for 33%, 100% of the 33%. But showing you here, they're going to increase their participation in terms of the money they give us for that population. So these are the people that are eligible for Medicaid in Arizona and actually in other states too, except childless adults unless the state expanded. So infants, children, the two different age groups, pregnant women, parents, the aged, blind, and disabled, everything in blue and sort of purple, and it's a dark blue that you can barely see, that is all mandated, meaning if we, if Arizona is going to be a Medicaid state, we must do that. I don't get to pick, you don't get to pick, the voters don't get to pick. The deal is the federal government participates financially if you cover that population. The, the um, far right bar graph that's in red, the childless adults, is our Prop 204 population. Medicaid said, you know, we don't ever expect you to cover this population back when we first voted it in. So we had to go to CMS and say, you know what? Our voters said we really want to cover the childless adult population. Will you give us a federal match for that? And it was 2000. They said, yeah, we'll match, we'll match the federal match. And the original federal match, you can see, was 67%. So when we decided in Arizona to expand the population, the federal government, as part of the Affordable Care Act, took their match up to 85% and paid for the expansion. So everything under the, under the lime green with the squiggly line is part of Medicaid. Everything above that, all in that lime green area from 100 and, there's areas where it's 133, 150, up to 400. All of those populations are eligible for the federal exchange that, that is operated in Arizona. So the red bar, not the red bar with the parents, but the red bar over here in the childless adults was what we had to make a decision on. We were facing a decision that basically said, your voters mandated it, you're not paying for it. The federal government was telling us, we're no longer going to match you 67% if you continue to freeze this population. Remember the Affordable Care Act went to the Supreme Court and it was two summers ago they ruled? And this is the part of the Affordable Care Act, because the bill was originally passed that that population was mandated, but with the, with the Supreme Court decision it said, it's unconstitutional for the federal government to mandate that population of the state. The states get to decide for themselves. And I think the number's at 26, 27 right now. 26 or 27 states, don't quote me on that. Look it up for if you're writing a story or you have to do homework. But just a little bit, it's around half the states have expanded. In Arizona, it made perfect sense because in our state, our voters mandated that we had to cover it. So if we decided not to expand, we would be on the hook for 100% of that population. And this is what those numbers look like. So remember we do that fiscal year that's weird, it ends in the middle of the, of the year. So don't look at 14, because it's only six months. Look at 2015, that's the first full year. If we paid for it ourselves, just that population, it's $154 million. Now, if we expand, we actually draw down, we actually, I, I want to make sure I'm getting these, because this is a difference, I'm not used to using this slide. It's $154 million expense to the general fund, and through that 85% participation rate, we draw down in the first full fiscal year about a, a, a billion and a half dollars, and it's the economic equivalent to Luke Air Force Base. So by just expanding, it would be like building and operating a new Luke Air Force Base in Arizona. And the money that we draw down to our state over four years is over $8 billion. And so in Arizona, we were, like I said, we were faced with this decision that either we're going to have to pay for it ourselves, which if we didn't, the state estimate would have been $435 million. And if we did, we would be able to draw down $1.5 billion and 
it would only cost us 154 million. It's really kind of complicated, but you kind of get like a little thumbs up, and shaking heads. You kind of, it was it was absolutely the most fiscally responsible decision we could do for the state of Arizona because our voters mandated it. That is not the case in Texas. That is not the case in California. Not the case in Florida. Every state has a unique and dis different decision that they have to make related to the expansion. So, if we had lost everything, if the federal government said we're just totally out. If you don't expand and you keep the freeze on, if we're totally out, we were looking at up to almost a $1.5 billion hit in one fiscal year. It would have bankrupt the state. And if you go back to that slide where I was talking about $8.5 billion uh, being the entire budget, imagine what a one-year billion and a half dollar hit to the general fund would be. Revenues are up. We've got a $450 million in the rainy day fund. We've got about $700,000 in surplus money that's going to have to kind of, we have to save for the future because we have ongoing um, expenses that we don't have incoming revenue for. But revenues are up, and we have the rainy day fund, and we haven't tapped the rainy day fund again. It was empty when I took office. We've restored it. So that's why this is a, this is a financial decision. Now, I can talk to you all day long why it was the right health policy decision to make. What happens to those patients, the 200 and some odd thousand people that fell off? If they get sick or they have diabetes or they have um, high blood pressure or they have a heart attack or they have cancer, where do they go? You guys tell me. Everybody. The emergency room. The uncompensated care that was reported down at the Capitol while we were debating this bill was almost, was more than double. And that was the state average. But if you really do dove into our rural safety net hospitals out in rural parts of Arizona, some of those hospitals were within six months of financial bankruptcy because there were large Medicaid populations in the rural areas and they were still getting sick. And the most expensive place to take care of your patients is in the emergency room because you can't manage their care there. So it's like a revolving door. And so we were really faced with a, uh, with a health crisis. I mean, obviously I'm telling you about the, the numbers, but we were faced with a health crisis. I mean, I can remember, unfortunately, being in the emergency room with my mom who had a stroke at the time and in the room right next to her was somebody with strep throat. Now, I'm not saying this is going to stop that from happening because people are still going to show up at the emergency room, as you will all probably see in your rotations, for random reasons. But to have it happen because they didn't have insurance was a real problem. So we had to do something to save our safety net rural hospitals across Arizona. Now, this is the rest of the story. So remember I said it's going to cost the Arizona match $154 million. Remember, that's what we still have to pay out of the general fund because the federal government's only paying 85%. The hospital said, you know what, Arizona, we know you're in trouble, and we know we have a fiscal crisis. We're in a fiscal crisis, but we want to be part of the solution. We are willing to have you assess us to garner money that you can then use as the state match to draw down the federal government. So we created in our Medicaid restoration plan a hospital assessment that draws down money from the hospitals which cannot be passed to consumers and is audited and it's checked and they, they can't, there's no fuzzy math there, so that they will actually be able to relieve the general fund of the Prop 204 expense. Now you might be thinking, well, why would the hospitals want to tax themselves or why would the hospitals want you to assess them? Why do you think the hospitals would want you to assess them? Because they what? Exactly. It was absolutely the most fiscally responsible thing for them to do because participating in a solution that provides health care, a, a payer for their health care system was a better bang for their buck than just having all the uncompensated care show up in the emergency room. They said, so Arizona, we're going to be a part of the solution. And right now, all of the hospitals are part of the solution and it's an extremely complex formula. The federal government has to approve it, which they have. Um, but most of the hospital systems, so if you look at a banner, a system it has a net gain. A John C. Lincoln and a Scottsdale Healthcare system has a net gain. Now, there may be a hospital loser in terms of paying more of the assessment than they're bringing in at an individual um, location. So, for example, Thompson Peak 
if you think about the Medicaid population there. But you spread that cost out among the system, which now they have merged, or I don't know what they're politically correct. They have affiliated, I think that's what they called, affiliated with John C. Lincoln. Across the system, they're a winner. But the hospitals were concerned. The hospitals were genuinely concerned. And my hospitals in particular, Mayo Clinic was really concerned because they don't see a large Medicaid population. They ended up being exempted from the assessment. Scottsdale Healthcare ended up, you know, in the positive. John C. Lincoln is in the positive, and those are my um, providers, my healthcare providers. But I worked very closely with them to make sure that this worked for them. And it's part of a, it was all part of the negotiation. So this legislative session, as always, we're still focused on economic recovery. We've got to figure out a way to make sure that we are setting Arizona up to be the greatest place to work to learn, to raise a family, and retire. And to do that, we've got to make Arizona the best place to, to grow jobs, high-paying jobs specifically. And we want to make sure we're, we're retaining the jobs that are here. And I'm here to tell you that healthcare is a huge economic engine for Arizona. I can't even begin to stress to you enough the, all of the presentations and all of the tours and all of the information that I have been able to receive down at the Capitol all signs point to healthcare as a thriving industry in Arizona. Can anybody tell me what the old five C's are of Arizona? What are they? Cotton, copper, cattle, citrus. What's the last one? Climate. That was 19, cactus, yes. Well, and somebody said this to me at my last presentation, that the new, the new C could be caring because it, it related to the healthcare industry. I believe that we're on a major transformation of our economy in Arizona. Obviously, we have an incredible defense industry here. We have um, a technology industry, a defense technology industry here. Uh, we're, building a, we're building data centers. We've got some manufacturers here. But healthcare specifically is a major economic engine because for every job that makes over $100,000, this is what the economists report to me, and I'm I'm overestimating, so it's every job over $100,000 actually brings, it's, that's called a base job, brings 2.5 more jobs with them through all of the things that they do if you make over $100,000. So if you think about healthcare, people that are, are, are doing well in healthcare bring the entire economy up. And so that's why it's really important to focus on what we're doing moving forward. And that's why the Medicaid restoration and expansion plan was so important because not only did it bring direct dollars into Arizona, I mean $8 billion over four years, it also allowed us to continue to grow to meet our population health care needs in Arizona. And so we're talking about reviving the economy. Child Protective Services and Education will always be part of our conversations down at the Capitol. And this year, probably Child Protective Services is going to take a lot of our time. So I think number one, and this was a conversation before the Affordable Care Act, and it's still a conversation, growing the physician, the, uh, physician pipeline and medical professionals across all areas. So really looking at graduate medical education is a huge issue for Arizona. I'm going to dive into that in a little bit. And then how do we deliver health care in this new economy? And the, the health care industry is changing and transforming. And I know, because I've sat in, in panels and presentations here at your community college, your community college is preparing you for health care in the future, not health care last century. And it is an integrated, coordinated model. And your responsibility as one person in that stakeholder process is going to increase. And we're going to have to do things differently. We're going to have to do things more efficiently. And we're going to have to work together across silos in healthcare, just like in education, that historically never really talked to each other and create this integrated care model. And in the, in the Affordable Care Act, they're called um, coordinated, oh my gosh, they're the medical home, but they're the ACOs, I'm accountable care organizations. And that's what you see, for example, Banner doing. And that's why John C. Lincoln and um, uh, Scottsdale Healthcare are affiliated. And I was at one presentation, and the person could have been wrong, so don't cite me on this. Um, a question was asked from a major healthcare economist, and they said, where do you see the wave of these, of, of these sort of consolidated healthcare groups coming and they said it could happen in the next 15 years that we have about 12 major systems across the country and that's what I heard somebody present and I, I'm seeing that come true the more time I spend as, as health chair. 
Um, I think also we're going to talk a lot about technology and how we can use that using telemedicine and technology in general. Electronic medical records, um, all of the new innovations that are happening in technology are going to really change the way we deliver healthcare and hopefully will make us more efficient and effective as well. Um, I start to hear people talking about preventative care. A lot of times the conversations around preventative care uh, revolve around, well, that's a lot of money up front, and, we, and how long is it going to take us to see a return on our investment? But you can look at things like all of the stop smoking programs that we've had, and you've, we can now show that the data that, yes, that has really made a difference in terms of healthy outcomes for Arizona. The big thing people are talking about right now is what? Obesity and sedentary lifestyles. And so we're, we're having conversations. How that's going to play out in the policy world, I don't know yet, but I definitely know we're talking about it. And then finally, just the basically the overall economic impact of healthcare. And what's really super exciting to me is all this bioscience industry work that we're doing in Arizona. We are attracting some of the greatest research minds in the world, not the country, in the world to Arizona. For example, <coughs> Our Alzheimer's research in Arizona is internationally renowned. And the, the phrase that has now been reported twice in the healthcare committee is that the brain that cures Alzheimer's disease will be an Arizona brain. We have the largest brain bank um, in the world right over here in the West Valley, right outside my district. And the researchers that are driving that are coming straight out of Phoenix. And so everybody in the whole world knows all the fantastic things we're doing in Arizona, and yet in our own home state, it's the best kept secret. And so what I'm trying to do as healthcare chair is to spread the word and spread the good news and all the exciting things we're doing. Because, and I love this, and I'm probably going to get this wrong, but you know, the research and the development that we do in Arizona benefits Arizona patients first. Because if we do it here and we're working with our citizens, we can hopefully be the first beneficiaries of that fantastic new knowledge that we're creating. And so that's what's really exciting to me related to healthcare. All of this, of course, done in, in the, I don't want to say shadow, I don't want to say, um, you know, I don't want to use a negative term, but under the umbrella of the Affordable Care Act, too. And so there's going to be a real sort of yin-yang relationship again, to use that term again, between how do you pay for this, how do you do this, how do you meet all this regulation, and how do you still innovate, how do you do new and unique and what we know is best practices under this new uh, umbrella of regulation. And so there's always going to be this sort of tug and pull relationship between that. So, growing the physician pipeline in Arizona is crucial. We've got an aging population, we've got a booming population, not booming as much as it was before the economy, but people are still coming here, it's the Sun Belt. And trust me, maybe after this winter we might see a whole new wave of people coming to Arizona. Especially when we're like the only people at 90 degrees when they're in a, what's it called, a polar vortex? What was that, is that what it's called? The polar, was that what it's called? Polar vortex, yeah. I'm sensing a whole new wave of, because I'm on Facebook saying, you ought to come to Arizona, it's 90 degrees. So what, this is really important because you and I as Arizona residents, the just sheer quantity of doctors in Arizona is going to affect our care. Because we may have the best doctor in the world, but if that doctor, if, if she has so many patients that you can't get in to see her, then that's going to be a problem. And so we really have to start focusing on this. And also, when we bring new doctors to the, to the valley, like I talked about, there's an economic impact of that just by sheer dollars that they either earn and that, that they put back into the economy through other jobs. And in Arizona, we have exponentially far fewer residents and physicians than per capita nationally. And that's a problem because back in 1996, the federal government froze the formula for how we um, how we fund and the number of residency spots we have for doctors. And so we are, are unfortunately frozen time at a time where we were not as large as we are today. Now we have more money going into our GME system and that's what's been reported down at the Capitol, but in terms of slots we are severely um, underpopulated or, or have not enough opportunity to train our residents here. Um, and then ultimately the demand for health care services is obviously increasing. And that's going to continue to do so as the Affordable Care rolls out. 
So these are some really interesting numbers. I don't have to go over the details with you. The ones that are circled are probably the ones that are most important for you to look at. So when you look at active primary care physicians, so go down to the, go to the, actually the bottom slide, active patient care primary care physician. Those means, that means it's not a doctor serving as a manager. It's actually a doctor seeing a patient. And if you look at the United States, rate per uh, 100,000 is 79.4, but in Arizona, we're at 68.1, we're ranked 43rd. Now, I don't know about you, but I see a lot of similarities to these numbers to the numbers that I see in education as well. These are two areas we don't want to be last in the country in. In both of these areas, we need to move up the, the rankings. And the only way we're going to do that is fundamentally reform and fund our uh, graduate medical education. Um, and also, just looking at the, last, at the last slide, if you look at the number of, um, we'll go back down to the active patient care, primary care physicians. It's a weird slide. That means doctors who are actually giving primary care services. If you look at that, in Arizona, we're going to need 757 physicians per 100,000 people. Thank you, Pele. And so we're at a severe shortage. And right now what's happening in Arizona with the residency slots, which I keep saying we don't have enough slots, the problem is I, I train teachers. And so nine times out of 10, wherever you do your student teaching is where you end up teaching. But think about it, why? You meet people, that's where you form your relationships, and that's where you interview, and hopefully if you've done a good job, you get a job. Well, in the, in the medical world, and it's the same thing in what you do, where you do your clinical rotations, you're going to establish relationships, so have a good positive attitude, work hard, meet as many people as you can, because if you do a good job, you're going to end up with a job there. So if we don't have the place to even put people, think about this. We, have, we only have um, the U of A Medical School. ASU is now partnered with um, Mayo Clinic. We've got a couple of DO schools um, in Arizona. But still, we, for our population size, do not have a lot of medical schools. But the ones we have, especially the ones we state fund, we're putting state taxpayer dollars into training the doctors and then kicking them out the door to another state to go do their residency because we, we don't have a spot for them. So how does that benefit the Arizona state taxpayer? This is probably the number one health care priority for the chamber and for the health care industry and for our medical researchers because we need to be training doctors in Arizona. And not just doctors for the sake of doctors. Primary care is huge. Pediatrics is huge in terms of primary care, but also our specialties. And then even further more complicated is our specialties in our rural areas. I mean, just getting a neurologist in Page, Arizona is a big deal, which is why telemedicine becomes an issue. Because if we can scale up our physician capacity using technology, it's a win-win for everybody. And now Mayo Clinic, for example, has a telestroke partnership with people, let's say, in Kingman. And they are able to use the neurologists that are at Mayo Clinic to deliver care remotely using telemedicine. So that's a, that's a, good, that's a good issue. And I don't want to beat the graduate medical edu education um, so story to a, to a pulp, but I will email you this so that you can hand it out to whoever. Pele, if you can make sure we get them a copy of this presentation. Um, the problem is, is we have this real imbalance in terms of what we get from the federal government because of that. I call it an artificial freeze. I mean, it's a very real freeze, but it was just a random snapshot in time where they froze it, and they haven't changed it since 1996. So I'm meeting with our federal delegation to tell them that this is a priority one issue for Arizona, and whatever we can do at the federal government, we need to start addressing this issue. The last but not least is the bioscience corridors. And, if, uh, and these are just some fantastic stats in terms of what we're doing in Arizona to set ourselves apart, both nationally and internationally, as a bioscience, bioscience center. And what that does is allows us to create research and development here in our own backyard using all sorts of funding sources, not only state dollars, but federal dollars, private grant dollars, private donations, endowments, and using that money to leverage our resources in Arizona to do innovative research and development here in our backyard, which I believe our Arizona citizens benefit from. And then by that, we get to attract these new industries to Arizona. So the really cool thing, or I, I thought it was the next slide, but I'll show you this. Paley goes, I put a graph in <laughs> as we were driving here. So this is the graph. <coughs> 
Arizona has experienced as you can see, exponentially higher growth area in the bioscience than anywhere else. And so we're doing it right, and yet you probably haven't heard a whole lot. Maybe you guys have because you're in the healthcare industry. But most of my constituents I talk to don't know this great news of what's happening in Arizona. And so we need to share it because we have to be our own champions. And this is a PR campaign. This is a PR campaign to make Arizona the most competitive state in this industry. Um, and so if you, if you look at, in terms of just the economic impact that we've had here, the economic activity generated has increased 99% in a, in a relatively short period of time. I mean, 2002 to 2009 is, is long to my daughter who's 12, but not long in an industry like this, and it has had huge impact. And last but not least, the coolest thing ever is that Mayo Clinic, ASU, City of Phoenix, and the State Land Department, well, they're not really partners, we just have to buy the state land, uh, they are building a biomedical corridor right smack dab in the middle of LD15. Anybody shop at Desert Ridge? Okay, so right there, that is going to be the biomedical corridor of the entire Southwest. And they are looking at developing all around Mayo Clinic to attract high tech companies to come in and do some of the most innovative research literally two miles, three miles down the road. So you are at the right place at the right time, literally in the right geographical location because I believe this is going to be wildly successful. They think they're going to be breaking ground within a year of some of these new developments. And it's going to be, they're going to have to do a state land trade. They're going to do some state land lease. They're partnering with public partner, public private partnerships, but it's going to be done right smack dab in the middle of my legislative district and your home area um, in LD 15. So uh, it's a 225 acre project uh, and it will further strengthen the region's growth as a national and international destination for healthcare related research, education, and private sector interests. Dr. Dector and his vision for what we're doing in that corridor is just incredible. And every time I hear him speak, I'm, I'm thoroughly impressed. So if you have a chance, there's been articles written in the Arizona Republic. There's actually a really cool video where you can uh, hear Dr. Decker talk online, and we'll make sure we, we get that link out to, to the group. Okay, remember the slide I showed you way back at the beginning, politics and policy? There is nothing more political than medical marijuana and legalizing marijuana. <laughs> I mean, that is about as political as it gets. So you're asking me if we are going to do something about it. If I had a Chris... Oh, there's absolutely talk. It's in the news. I mean, there are, there are members of the Democrat Party who have introduced legislation to decriminalize it. Um, yesterday in the Health Committee, and I supported a, an amendment to the medical marijuana fund that we collect with cards that the dispensaries have to get about. What did they say it was at? $7 million? $6 million? $6.5 million. So the cards that we've given out for uh, medical marijuana, that has generated money at DHS and the dispensaries about six, meaning if you are a licensed dispensary, you have to pay your fee to be a dispensary. That fund is six and a half million dollars and we just passed a bill yesterday to, it's one step out of 15, so don't say, I mean, I can't guarantee it's gonna pass and I can, actually I can pretty much tell you it's probably not gonna pass, but we have introduced the idea that we're gonna use some of that money to do research. The U of A, Dr. Sue Sisley, um, wants to do research related to medical marijuana to show its efficacy so that they can say it either works or it doesn't work. Um, so there's a lot of talk, yes. Okay, so, so Pele says I, I should explain Prop 105. In Arizona and in Colorado, this was all done at the ballot box. Okay, so we passed in Arizona 2010, the Medical Marijuana Act. And so it was done by the voters. And Proposition 105, which I've talked about before, remember what I said about Prop 105? We can't change it. We can only further the mission at the legislature. If we want to do anything differently, you have to go back to the voters and ask them. So that's why this is going to be a real challenge on how we use this fund, because in the voter in the voter approved initiative for medical marijuana, how that fund was to be used, um, there, there are some parameters in there, but we would like to drill down into a little bit more detail on how we'd like the fund to be used. Uh, drug awareness programs, SRO officers in schools to teach about drug awareness, uh, medical marijuana research, things like that are all things people are talking about the Capitol. 
what Colorado did, there are people talking about putting that on the ballot. Whether it happens or not, uh, that's up for the voters of Arizona to decide. They have to get the signatures, the signatures have to be approved, and then it has to go to the ballot, and then it has to be voted on. That's the process for that. And there's no additional taxes based on the way it was passed at the ballot box originally. And so that's where we're at in Arizona. Prop 105 is real, it's important. And you know when you get your ballot in, for, for November, which the primary is in August, so you need to remember that. And the general is in November. And when you get your ballot for November, <coughs> there will be a lot of things on there. Anything you vote on is basically statutorily the equivalent of putting concrete. We can't, we can't modify it at the legislature other than to further it. So will Arizona go the way of Colorado? I have no idea. Um, people are extremely passionate on both sides of the issue, and it's going to probably, if I guess, come down to the voters, yay or nay. So her question was related to public health. And we obviously have the DHS, Department of Health Services, and they run a lot of our public health programs. And her question was specifically about funding. Well, it all folds into this whole $8.5, $9 billion general fund issue right now. And right now, in terms of where we're looking at uh, the general fund expenditures over this next budget cycle to go, there's not a lot of extra money to spend right now because at the end of the day, we are still recovering and our extra money that we have is going to have to go forward to pay things off and then we're going to have to hopefully increase revenues so that we can continue paying for those things. So specifically with DHS, I'm trying to think like what would be an example of something new that we're expanding with DHS. I mean, I'm working on a bill with newborn screening for DHS so that we um, are adding a, a pulse ox test for newborn. Majority of the states actually have it in, in statute that we do that. We're one of only 17 states that don't. Uh, we're looking at we're putting in um, a provision for the Depart DHS to look to see if there are other newborn screening tests, uh, specifically skids and the Crave disease, so that they can look at the, the benefits of doing that. That's with the newborn screening. We've got a lot of work we're doing with DHS related to vaccinations. There's a huge, huge crisis in Arizona. Um, our, phys our pediatric physicians the number one cost driver in their individual practice is vaccinations. It is probably the most expensive thing they do, and it costs a lot of money to house the vaccinations, the refrigerator to keep the vaccinations in, and then if somebody doesn't present to them with insurance, they don't get reimbursed. To the point where a lot of our rural pediatricians just aren't doing vaccinations anymore, and they send their patients to the county hospital. Well, we fixed the problem at the county, because then the county was having to pay for it, and they didn't have the money to do it. We have created a bill that, that allows the counties to be a designated a provider so they can get reimbursed using federal dollars. But uh, the vaccination with, with kids is a huge public health issue. The other things we've worked on related to public health, obviously, with, we have smoke, smoking cessation programs out there with the tobacco funds. The tobacco funds, here's the ironic thing. I mean, the tobacco, the smoking, the stop smoking campaigns are so successful, then the money that goes into the tobacco programs is actually declining, and that money goes to spend on other things like Prop 204. That's the, supposed to be the main funding source for Prop 204, but that money ran out. So there's, there's still money related to that. Um, so the federal, the residency spots that the federal government funds froze in time at 1996 across the country for all states. So it was a federal government decision in terms of the money that they put into our system. Now in Arizona, we've put money into our system and we used to put money into our system with access. But when we had to freeze the population, we also cut all access funding for residency spots. So other people have gone out and used creative funding solutions and partnered with people. So like I think PCH has a really innovative GME program. Um, Banner Good Sam has a really innovative program, but they're using non-traditional revenue sources to do it. And it's really, really expensive to start one. So programs that exist, you can grow them one or two or three or four spots, but to go into like a rural Arizona a hospital and start from scratch. There's a lot of startup capital that's involved in that, and we don't have any dollars available to start new programs where they don't exist. The closest we've ever come to doing anything related to that is partnering with our community health centers, and especially around primary care. Um, our community health centers are now designated as sites 
existing residency programs that happen in urban areas, they will rotate their, um, their students through an, a rural site through their community health centers. And that has been about the most innovative thing that we've done. But actually building a brand new residency program in rural Arizona, just not the dollars for it. And that would, uh, that's something that we need to consider if there's ever extra dollars. I think the future of healthcare is really going to also include a redefinition of the work you do as nurses. Because you, the doctors probably aren't gonna like me saying this, but you can't rely, especially when we have a physician shortage, you are going to be called upon in your professional career to do more and more and more. Am I, am I striking a chord? Are you agreeing with me? <laughs> are you, uh, I'm seeing a yes shake in the back of the room. I can, I can see it as clear as day. I mean, Arizona has one of the rom robust scope of practice laws related to physician assistants, nurse, nurse practitioners, um, say our nurse anesthetists. Uh, we, we allow, I don't, I don't even know what the right word, non-DOs and MDs to do lots of things that in other states you can't do. And this is a little plug for you guys as you mature in your career and as you move on. You have got to get involved with your professional association. And it's, it's a membership fee. You need to join. You need to be involved. You need to be engaged. Because the biggest shock to me is health chair at the Capitol. When I was first sitting down and, and working with a lobbyist who was trying to get me to change in statute, the optometrists were allowed in statute, and this is the way the statute read, to um, dispense ibuprofen at two times the over-the-counter label, labeling um, dosage. And I'm like, okay, I used to be in pharmaceutical rep, so you're telling me in statute, you're telling somebody to double, use over-counter the drugs, and just do it double. And they're like, yeah, that was our negotiated agreement because they didn't want to give us prescribing authority. I'm like, what? I go, so in other words, now you're going to be taking 800 milligrams of ibuprofen. Not, the pharmacist isn't going to know it. You're not going to know what other medication you're on. And what if there's an interaction or what if there's a problem? There will be no medical record of what you're taking and how much you took. It's just, hey, I know the bottle says take two, but you can go on ahead and take four. And that was in statute. And so we had to run a bill that cleaned that up and said, no, now they can prescribe it so that it's actually prescription, they can go to the doctor, they can go to the pharmacist and they can get it filled, it can be on their medical record, they can look at drug interactions, they can look at allergies. And so what's interesting is I looked at the guy and I went, oh my gosh, with one vote, I can fundamentally change your career tomorrow with one vote. And I'm not a nurse and I am a doctor, that's my joke. I am a doctor, but I'm not an MD, I have an EDD and ed leadership, for goodness sake. And I literally, manage stakeholder meetings this year it's a big huge fight between the optometrist again and the ophthalmologist over or um uh, steroids in the eyes doing injections in the eyes i don't even remember what i'm not even listening to them anymore because i'm just mad at them right now i mean they because they're fighting it's 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 basically a food fight between medical professionals and it's all done down at the capitol and if you're not engaged and involved in what you do as a professional you have spent way too much time way too much money to get your degree to allow somebody like me to change your career in one vote and that's what happens right now the acupuncturists are in a fight with the physical therapists over dry needling so I, somebody said they wanted to be a physical therapist in here. Where do we? Okay, physical therapist, so the lone physical therapist. Are they training you how to do dry needling or do you do dry needling? Okay, well, if they train you, if your program trains you to do dry needling, it's not in statute that you're allowed to do it, but it's not in statute that you're not allowed to do it. And so the board got an AG's opinion and said that they would allow people to do it. Well, now the acupuncture, acupuncturists have filed all these complaints, and they've come down to, the law, and down to the legislature, and they're picketing the legislature with needles. It's real fun. With needles <laughs> saying, stop the physical therapist. So we have huge scope of practice fights every single year. The psychiatrists and the psychologist in an ever-ending battle. The psychologists want to be able to prescribe. The chiropractors asked for prescribing authority for pain medication. All of these battles happen at the state level. 
So you may, you may be uh, training in Arizona, and you're training to do A, B, C, D, and E, but you move to Colorado, and while marijuana might be legal, you're not allowed to do D, e that you, D and E that you were trained for. I know, now he's like, I'm gonna notice the medical marijuana guy. <laughs> but, but, do you, but do you understand what I'm saying? It's all done at the state level. I had no idea. I mean, I knew they, they, they were influential in my teaching degree, but I didn't realize at the medical level that we dictate in state statute everything that you can do as a professional. And who has to supervise you and what you can prescribe and what you can do and what you can't do. And so if you're not involved and your professional organization is your organization that advocates for you. So you've got to get involved, pay your dues, get involved, go to the Capitol, make sure you register to vote and meet your legislative uh, representatives and senators because we vote on stuff for you all day, every day. And some of it can be great and some of it you can be completely opposed to and it might be scary. So her question is about uh, preventative care and what you can do to get involved. Come down to the Capitol, meet your representatives, whoever it is. You can go to azledge.gov and look up who your representatives are. There's a, there's a website there. There's a link there that shows you your maps. Find out who they are. Contact them. Tell them what's important to you. We have these conversations all the time down at the Capitol, especially around preventative care. Um, we really haven't funded a lot of preventative care. Like even in the access program, we're not even funding podiatry. I mean, so, so now if you have a, a foot problem or you're diabetic, you have to have your, your care met your care met by a um, uh, either an orthopedic doctor or a, your medical doctor who's not trained necessarily in doing that so we're still recovering financially on some things that we used to do that aren't even considered preventative like adult dental we used to have adult dental benefits the first thing we cut was the preventative benefits then we cut the emergency benefits now we've shown that there's exponential cost in the ER and if you think about it it makes sense people presenting to the ER with emergency dental work and there's no benefits to cover to cover that and you've got doctors pulling teeth in the ER because they don't have they don't have medical benefits that was just our testimony last week and so I support preventative care. I think it's absolutely crucial through some community and public-private public, par public partnerships. There's some really innovative things going on, especially in the private market um, it, with nonprofits. There's some really cool programs going on with schools and communities. But at a state level, I don't see a lot, a lot of funding going in that area because we're still recovering from an economic crisis. But it's always up for conversation. So the day when all these fantastic high-paying jobs come and we build out the biomedical corridor and we've got all these fantastically new trained medical professionals and everybody's making lots of money and spending it and we're raising lots of tax dollars, then I'm sure we're going to talk about that hopefully sooner rather than later. But right now, we're still coming out of the crisis. Stay involved, stay engaged. I do think that's going to be part of the future of healthcare is really looking at the preventative side. So... I think that's it. We've got the cane, and we're right at 2, 8.32. Oh, very good. Let's give Heather a, a round of applause. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, I, I hope that was interesting. Stay in touch. Um, we'll make sure we get the presentation to you. And my website is just, um, it's Heather Carter, uh, it's voteheathercarter.com, which you can email me there, or hcarter at azledge.gov. And come to the Capitol. Healthcare meetings on Wednesday, it was standing room only. We even had to have the fire marshal come in and tell, ask people to leave the room because I invite everybody to the Capitol and they come. <laughs> and it's really cool, so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming tonight.